A lot of us waste a lot of time while doing data science. How do I know that? Because I've been there. So in this video, I've packaged all the most useful tips I've learned the hard way in the past six years working in data science field. I'll be showing you tons of tips and tricks for Visual Studio Code, Jupyter Notebook, Python, R and R Studio. We also cannot forget Excel. With this video, I want to share some basic and not so basic things you might not have learned at school or most data science training. Also tricks that ChatGPT can not teach you. I wish someone had taught me all this way sooner in my career. I'll be demonstrating those tips on a MacBook, but they should work the same for Windows, just using slightly different keyboards. It's a long video, so feel free to use the timestamp below to jump around to what you're most interested in. Without further ado, let's get started. Okay, tip number one. Jupyter Notebook is a popular tool for data science, but it's actually much better to use Jupyter Lab or Visual Studio Code instead. Here I have my Jupyter Labs uh, documentation open, and here is Visual Studio Code, which you can download and use for free. And for Jupyter Lab, you can easily install it via pip. And so suppose I already, uh, I'm already in the project uh, directory, I can simply type Jupyter Lab to start up my Jupyter Lab within this directory. And what's nice about these IDEs is that they integrate the notebooks. So here are the notebooks and text editor. So um, the text editor could be, for example, if you create a text file and you can type something here, hello, and also the terminal. So here you can easily um, start the terminal, a new terminal in, within Jupyter Lab and also the um, directory viewer. So here are all the files within my directory. You have all of this within one place. And in Jupyter Lab, you can also easily rearrange the cells and also create splits view, for example. And so it's very, very convenient and it's perfect for more complex projects. And also similarly for Visual Studio Code as well. So let me start up my Visual Studio Code. And this is how this um, this project would look like within Visual Studio Code. And you can see that um, it also has all the different features, um, the uh, Git version control, you have the um, debugging tool. And so all these conveniences will save you a lot of time in a more complex data science project. And if you want to watch a full demonstration of all the useful features in Jupyter Lab, you can check out my earlier video over here. Okay, tip number two is all about shortcuts. Um, let me show you some useful shortcuts, uh, keyboard shortcuts that I find most useful when working in Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab. And let me quickly open this notebook over here. So in case you don't know it already, within Jupyter Notebooks, there are two modes that you are in. So the first mode is the editing mode. So that's the mode that I'm in. I can just type and edit the cells. And the second mode is the command mode. So uh, to switch from the editing mode to the command mode, we can simply hit escape on the keyboard. And so you can see that the cell is grayed out, a little bit grayed out. And this is also equivalent to clicking on the left side of the cell over here. And to switch back to the editing mode, we can simply hit enter. So from here's the editing mode. Now switching to the command mode, hit escape and enter, editing mode, escape enter and escape, enter. So that's how you switch between these two modes. Now, when you're in the command mode, you can use a few different keyboard shortcuts to do different things uh, in your notebook. Now from here, if I hit A, I will add a new cell above the current cell. If I hit B, then it will add a cell below the current cell. And if I hit Z, that would um, undo the last step. And another Z, that's undo the next last step. And also uh, if I want to convert the current cell into the markdown cell, so then I would just hit M. So this would turn the current cell into a markdown cell, as you can see, but I don't want this and I want this back into a code cell, then I would just uh, hit Y. So M is a markdown format and Y is the code format. Now, suppose that I decide that this cell is no longer needed, I would just hit DD to delete this cell. Okay, here's also another keyboard shortcut that I think is quite fun. So suppose that I'm running a code cell. So for example, I have this just random code cell over here. If I'm running it, 
and I realize that oh, I just, I'm running in the wrong code cell, I can just interrupt the kernel by hitting II. So this is a keyboard interrupt, which is equivalent to clicking on this um, square over here to interrupt the, the kernel, but you can also simply using the keyboard shortcut that is II. And now suppose that I've messed up the whole kernel and I want to restart the kernel, I can simply hit 00, zero to restart the kernel. And here I can just simply hit enter to restart this whole kernel. And here's where things get really mind blowing. I notice that when I'm cleaning a notebook, a very messy <laughs> notebook, I usually find myself wanting to merge two or multiple code cells together because I think, well, if everything is only one line of code uh, in each cell, it would be too many cells. And I think it's a little bit hard to read and understand the structure of the notebook. So it's usually useful to merge these cells together. I think what people usually do is to just copy paste this code into the other cell, but there is a faster way to do it. First, you just need to select these two cells that you want to, um, to merge. So for example, I'm clicking on this cell over here and I also select the next uh, cell. So you just need to press the shift keyboard and um, hit the down arrow here to select multiple cells. So suppose that I'm just selecting these two cells together and then I would just hit shift M to merge these two cells. So I can now just rerun this cell to have the result all together. So it is, it is very, very fast. Similarly, also I have some code here. It's both to create some correlation matrix. So I would rather just merge these two cells together so that um, they are a little bit easier to follow. So I just do the same. I would just uh, select these two cells and shift M to have the whole thing together. And another keyboard shortcut that I think everyone should know is for bulk commenting your code. So I see a lot of people just do this and this and this, but actually it's just totally unproductive and it's also very time consuming. So you can just simply select multiple cells um, and then hit command slash to bulk comment uh, your code and also hit comment slash another time to um, undo the commenting. And here's a less known tip in Jupyter Notebook. Suppose if you want to quickly insert an image into a cell, for example, let me download something. So let me just save image here. And to be able to add this image into this code cell, what you can do is just to first turn this cell into a markdown cell. So we already know how to do that. So I would just hit escape and hit M to convert this cell into a markdown cell. And then I just drag this image over here and ta-da, we have this image in our notebook. So it's a very simple and easy way to add a picture or a diagram into your notebook. And you might also notice that we have this markdown code over here. And this is exactly the code that is used to generate this, um, this markdown cell, including this picture. Okay, so on the first day at your new job, how do you make yourself look more pro? So instead of just clicking around the whole day with your mouse like this and scrolling around, you can simply use the keyboard to move around more quickly and more accurately. And I'll show you how. If I have a relatively long notebook like this, I would prefer to use the space key to go through it page by page. And to scroll up again, I would use shift space to scroll up to the top of the notebook. Or if you want to scroll all the way down to the bottom of the notebook, you can simply hit control and arrow down key and control arrow up key. That is to go all the way to the top, down, top. I think a lot of these shortcuts and tricks also work in Visual Studio Code as well, but uh, we'll talk a whole lot more about Visual Studio Code later. Okay, the next tip regarding moving around quickly with the keyboard is a little bit basic, but I think a lot of people tend to forget hitting backspace like this all the time to delete the code and the markdown. But a better way to do this is to hit backspace together with pressing the option button so that you can delete word by word um, like so. It's much faster and less error prone. And if you want to delete this whole line instead of 
selecting it and hit backspace, you can simply hit Command D to delete this whole line. The next tip I want to share with you is to create multi cursors. This is useful when you want to type at multiple places at once. Suppose that I don't like this credit name anymore as the name of my data frame, I would hold down the control key and click on different places that I want to edit. So here I have three places that I have the cursors on. Now I can just edit it all at the same time. Or I can also add things or change it to anything. In Jupyter Notebooks, it's unfortunate that you cannot do this for multiple cells. You can only create multi cursors on a same, the same cell. So if I want to do this with multiple cells, it just doesn't work. So in this case, you can use the find and replace feature instead. So I just hit control F to find and you can do find anything like credit data and you can change it to a different name. So change it back to credit or anything else and then replace all. Then that would help us replace things for multiple cells in the same notebook. Okay, the next tip is about code completion. I've seen a lot of people, especially newbies into coding and data science, just type manually everything like this. So just type everything like this. But actually in JupyterLab or Visual Studio Code, you just need to type something like credit and then hit the tab key. Then this would auto complete it for you. Okay, now we get to a slightly more challenging topic debugging. Using the debugger is something I think every data analyst or data scientist should be comfortable with. What's worse than copying some functions from Stack Overflow or ChatGPT, and then you can't find out why it's not working, right? For example, I'm really bad with dates. Hmm, no puns intended. But you know, weird and inconsistent date time formats can break the code and it would take me hours to figure out. Of course, you can also manually go into the functions and the code and print out the output, but that's less cool. Now, let me walk you through how to use the debugging tool within JupyterLab, and later I'll also show you how it works in Visual Studio Code and RStudio as well. Now, as long as you know all the basics of debugging, all the IDEs would work exactly the same. So here on the top right of the notebook, you will see there's a bug icon here. This is the debugging tool. And the first section is the variable section. This is where you can see all the variables within your current environment. You can already see here are the variables that we have in our environment. We also have some function variables. So that is the square function that we defined here and the test function as well that we defined over here. So we'll see how it is useful in a bit. And next to that, we have the call stack. This is where you can see which function is being called at each different step of your call stack. And then we have the breakpoints. We'll see what it looks like in a bit. And we have the source. So they will show the source code that we executed. Yeah, suppose that I have a very silly example. I have a function to square a number and we have a test function that basically takes um, the square of a number and then do some calculation on it and return the value. So here's the mode three and um, we were, the result would be multiplied with five and we return that result. So it's very, very simple. But here, first I just pass a number, like number two, into this function. But later I also pass uh, a string that is hello into this function. Okay, I know that we cannot square a string like this and this would definitely throw an error if you want to try it. Yeah, so one way to debug your code if in case the functions get a little bit complicated and you cannot really track um, the steps as easy as it looks over here, then yeah, you might also want to just print out all the value at each different step of your function. But this is actually not a proper way to debug your code dynamically and it's also not very efficient. So I'll show you how to use a debugging tool to, um, to debug your code easily. So the easiest way is to create some breakpoints over here within a function that we think is a little bit complicated to follow and um, the code execution will stop 
at each different breakpoint so that we can examine the, um, the execution of the function. Now we can see that we have defined three breakpoints over here. If we run this, you can see that, okay, we are now at this step. Right. This is the first breakpoint, and you can see that x equals to two. So because we have passed in two as the argument for the test function, and okay, this is all good. And from here, there are a few different actions that we can take to control our debugging flow. Here in the call stack section, we can see that we have a few different buttons. Some people, including my younger self, would just click on those buttons randomly without really understanding what's going on. But actually, it's not that hard to understand. I'll quickly show you how it works. So the first button is the continue button. So if you click on this button, then we'll go to the next breakpoint. So here we are jumping now to the second breakpoint. And in our environment, we can see that we have an extra variable that is y equals to four, which is the, which is two squared. And if we continue to click on continue, then we will at some point reach the last breakpoint. And after that, um, the, the debugging would be stopped. So this is um, where we stopped. We see that not the, also so the second button is actually just to terminate the debugging, but um, yeah, we, we don't want to do it right now. The next button is next. So next means that we will continue to the next line of the code. So for example, if I'm here um, on the first breakpoint and I click on next, this would go to the next line of the code. But actually it's not a very good example here because this seems to be quite the same as the continue button as if we, we first saw. However, if for example, if I have a next um, line over here, so let's say it is uh, just test equals Z and I don't have a breakpoint. Oh, let me just terminate this one to update this function. Now, if we click on next, next, we see that we are now at the next line of the code, right? Compared to the continue, then if we click on continue over here, then we will just jump directly to the next breakpoint. However, for next, then we will just go line by line. Now I just click on next again, and we can see all the variables that we have over here, including the test variable. Okay, now if continue, then we go to the test hello, and we can see exactly where the problem occurred, right? Uh, we can see that the axe is actually hello. And if we continue, then we get um, an error over here. So this is where we get the problem. It's very easy to see exactly where the error occurred. And we can, from there, we can uh, fix our code. Now, let me just terminate this one. Now, suppose that we are here, and we know that after this function, we will get an error. So this function caused some problem. Now, the way we can go into this square function and examine what's going on is that we can click on the step in option. So this option will help us go into this square, this sub function in order to examine, okay, now the num variable is hello. And we can see that, oh, it doesn't make sense to take a square of a string like this, right? So this is how we can recognize, we can identify the problem in our code. And then after we examine the function, we can step out of this function. So this is the option to step out. And now we we'll go back into our test function. You might also have noticed that when we go into different functions, we will have different list of variables over here. Suppose, for example, here that I have the variable x within this test function. But if I go into um, this square function, then now I don't have x anymore, but I have the num variable equals to two. So this is because we are within the context of this square function, and that is different from the context of the test function. Now, if you're new to all this, it might be a little bit confusing, but if you just practice a few times, you get the hang of it very quickly. Now, suppose that what we have is not a notebook like this, but more um, a Python script. So for example, if I have I also have the Python scripts over here of the same code. And if I want to debug this code, we can also debug this script by right click on the script and we create console for editor and select the kernel. And now we can also click on the 
little buck icon over here and we set the breakpoint as we did before. And now if we just run this code over here, we can also do exactly the same as uh, we had uh, we did before. Okay, another cool thing in Jupyter Notebooks is that we can also use the built-in magic command. So let me just uh, open my magic notebook over here. Oh. These are examples of magic commands. So you can recognize them by seeing that they have the little percent sign over here or exclamation mark is also, um, it also works as well. Now, if we run this, we can see that we have, these are terminal commands, right? And we, we can see that here's a list of all the, all the files that are within my folder. And these are, uh, this is the path to my current directory. That's why these commands are called magics. It is because you can use them to run terminal commands or interact with different programming languages right inside a code cell uh, within a Jupyter notebook. Another common example you probably already know is, um, uh, for example, pip install a Python package, right? For example, pip install Seaborn. So this is uh, also a magic command. And similar to this, we can also do all kinds of different things that we usually do in um, command line. For example, I just create a directory, make directory. For example, I name it test. If we refresh this, we will see that we have a new photo test over here. So this is super handy. And if we have several lines of magics in the same cell that we want to run at the same time, we can use the, um, the double percent sign and bash expression like this. And this, uh, with this, we don't need to type the magic, um, this percent sign for every line. So if I do this, it would work also exactly the same. And this is handy when we have multiple magic commands in the same cell. And we can also see all the available magic commands within Jupyter Notebook by typing percent sign list magic. Yeah. Then here we can see that we have a bunch of magics over here. And notice that we have two types of magics. The first one is the line magics. And the second type is the cell magics. The line magic simply means that um, the magic is only in one line. So let's go through some of these line magics. So uh, we, we just tried, for example, here we have, let's see, we have print a working directory. We just tried it. It's a line magic. The second one is, yeah, make directory. Or we also have pip um, is also a line magic. So the line magic is just one line. The cell magic are the magics that are uh, running for the whole cell. So the example of some of them are uh, time it. So if we have one uh, cell of code that we want to time, then we can also use the, the cell magic uh, time it. And we also have the bash here, um, which we just uh, just tried, right? The bash, uh, the bash magics. And you might also notice that with cell magics like this one that we are using, we are using it with the double percent sign versus for the line magic, we are only using one percent sign. So that is a major difference. I find that the time it magic is really, really useful when we want to time the uh, execution time of a code cell. So for example, if I have a code cell like this, just to read in the data, and I want to time this code cell, I can use time it magic. Um, the, this is a cell magic to time this whole cell. So if I run this, we can see that we have the time uh, over here, right? But suppose if we only want to time this one line of code, we can also do this by using the line magic, time it. So with only 1% sign, this will effectively time only this one line of code. And you might also notice that we have a time magic as well. So not time it, but time. So um, if I do this, it will be doing almost exactly the same. However, it will only run the code only one time. 
and it shows us the CPU time and the wall time that's needed to run the code. But the time it magic is more accurate because with the time it magic, the code will be run several times um, to give us a more accurate estimation of the time. So including the mean and the standard deviation of the time that is needed to run this code cell. In general, this time it magic is very useful when you want to compare different um, the running time of different code cells, or you can see what's the best way to write a function and how best to optimize a certain code cell. Okay, the next tip that is a little bit random is the um, is latex. So sometimes in our project we might want to type formulas within our notebooks to communicate the relationships between variables and how certain things are calculated, then you might find it useful to um, be able to, uh, to actually write formulas within notebooks. So the way to do that is just to create a markdown cell. So I will just uh, turn this cell into the markdown cell as we know by pressing escape and M. So this will be uh, now the markdown cell. Enter to start editing this cell. Now we just include first a dollar sign. And so for example, if I say f x is equal to, for example, x power, example power three, and then end it with another dollar sign, then here we are, we have a formula that is uh, properly formatted with latex. So it is a very nice way to type formulas uh, within Jupyter Notebooks. Moving on to Python tricks. I have to say there are more cool tricks in Python than I can possibly cover in my lifetime, but I'll go over some most important tricks that I use day to day here. Okay, the first Python trick that I wanna show you is the chaining comparison. So what is chaining comparison? Now, suppose that we have a condition like this. However, it is much easier to read by using a chaining comparison, so this whole thing is simply equivalent to uh, four smaller than max, smaller than or equal to six. So this is um, this is a shorter way to create a condition like this, and um, it makes it also easier to read um, and makes your code more elegant as well. Okay, another small tip that I love is using f strings. So for example, if I, if I want to print out something, for example, here are a bunch of random variables that I defined, and I want to print out, hello, my name is, and I am um, blah, blah, blah years old, and my size is width times height. So it's so very random. Well, this is the older style of printing something. Then uh, we just use the format method like this and define all the different variables over here. However, from Python 3.6, I think onwards, we can actually just uh, pass in variables like this within our f strings. So here, we, the only difference is that we have the f string over here at the beginning before we define our string. And then we can just pass in our variables within these curly brackets. So you can see that it's exactly the same, um, but it's much uh, easier to read and also shorter as well. Okay, moving on to the next small tip, uh, that is to use list comprehension instead of for loops. You might have already seen me do this a lot in my project videos. Now, suppose that I have a data set like this and I want to get a list of all the column names that contain loan. Here I'm using list comprehension. So, um, for each column within all the columns of this data frame, return this column name if uh, loan is in the column. Now, this is also very much equivalent to uh, using for loop for call in credit columns. Now we just define the loan columns as an empty list. And now if loan is in column, then we just append this to, to the loan columns, right? Let me just quickly run this to make sure that I have it. Yeah. And then we have the loan columns, which is exactly uh, the same as this one. However, you can see that this takes me like three, four lines of code, and this is much more elegant, much easier to read, right? I've also come to realize that list comprehension is not necessarily always be faster than a for loop. For loops are sometimes also fine as long as it's not overly complicate this whole um, this whole function or this uh, whole procedure. However, I find that 
list comprehension is just way easier to read and also much shorter and that's why I yeah most of the time would prefer doing this instead of this. A good practice when creating Python projects is to create a virtual environment to encapsulate all the necessary requirements for the project. If you follow my channel, you've probably seen me do this a lot in my project videos. Now, if you're using Conda or Mini Conda, you can just create a virtual environment by typing Conda create and then the name of your environment. However, usually I don't use Conda, so I just um, do it just uh, in a regular way on my MacBook by Python 3 slash M and virtual environment. I can never remember this thing and uh, dot slash. So this would create a new environment within my current folder. So my productivity science folder. And if I run this, I would effectively have created this environment. And then um, to activate, I'll just type source bin activate. And now I'm in this virtual environment. And if we check this folder, we can see that um, it has created a bunch of um, photos over here. So um, these photos are the photos that include all our packages, our dependencies that kind of define our virtual environment. If you're on a Windows, you might have slightly different um, different commands. However, it's very similar. And once we are done with our environment, we can simply deactivate our virtual environment. So this would um, take us out of our virtual environment. Okay, the nice thing about working within a virtual environment is that you can also easily create a requirements file for our project. And uh, so let me just quickly go back into our current uh, environment. We can easily do pip free and create a requirements.txt file. Now, if we check back in our in our folder, we will see a requirements file over here. And this requirements file, well, it doesn't have anything because um, we haven't installed anything within our uh, virtual environment. But if we have any packages, they will effectively be showing up here. So if someone wants to reproduce your whole project, they can simply uh, take your requirements file and they can do simply pip install and slash r is stands for requirements and they can just uh, do requirements.txt like this and this would install all the packages that are within the requirements file uh, for you and notice that if we don't run the pip freeze within a virtual environment then you would end up with a huge list of everything that is installed on your computer and it is probably not very necessary and also you don't want to share that huge list with everyone. So let me just try it out and let's see what happens over here. I'll deactivate and uh, I will just um, do pip3 install. Let's see. Yeah, then you can see that we have a lot of different things within here. I don't even know all these uh, packages that have been installed in my computer. So you probably don't want to share this with everyone because it's not relevant for your project. There's a lot of tips and tricks for working with data, but here's my favorite. There's a package called Pandas Profiling that gives you a very nice profiling report of your data. It can automate simple but very important checks such as data distribution, missing values, and correlation between different variables. In one of my projects at work where we built a machine learning model for classifying the client risk for a bank, my colleagues and I looked at the profiling report and found out that somehow we forgot to impute one of the columns that actually has quite some missing values and small things like that are quite easy to miss if you have a large data set to work with. So if you're working with large data sets, a library like this can help you cut down on repetitive checks and save you a lot of time. If you do more machine learning, I'll also recommend you check out the explainer dashboard library, which helps you explain the workings of a fitted machine learning model. This library also saved me a lot of time trying to better understand 
understand the machine learning model I just created. Okay, for quick analysis, there's a fun thing that you can do within Jupyter Notebook that is to apply colors um, to a data frame such that you can emphasize certain data points. So here is how it looks. I also didn't know before that within pandas package, there is um, a style method. So here is the style method that you can use to define a certain uh, condition, a certain styling options for your, um, for your data points. So here's my data frame and I have created a little function here that basically apply the style to the max value of, um, of all the numeric columns over here. And I also set the color for the max values um, to be green and um, the mean color. So here's a yeah, styling for the min values um, that is orange. And so if I run this function, this would effectively highlight all the values that fall within those conditions. So uh, here for all the columns, you can see that we have some orange values here that are the lowest value within the salary column and green for the max uh, value of the column and similar here as well. So this is quite handy if you want to just highlight certain um, results within your notebook. And um, yeah, note that for bigger data sets, I think this would not be very useful because the data set would be too long to scroll through um, to even see those colors. But here for small data sets, I think it's, uh, it's pretty neat um, to highlight these values. Okay, moving on to the next tip that is type hinting. Now, suppose that you are a little bit moving to a more senior position and you might want to write more production ready Python code, then it's useful to use type hinting. Okay, let me quickly get this notebook up here. So why is type hinting useful? It is because, for example, if we have a function like this, we'll kind of have to guess what kind of data um, type that are um, required for each of these arguments, and also what is the type of the data that is returns. So it, it is a lot of guessing and assuming about the types of the arguments and the variables. So type hinting is an enhancing kind of style to help us tackle this uh, this issue. Now with type hinting here, so this calculates BMI function, um, we can see that for each of these arguments, we explicitly define which uh, which data type that it requires, and also what is the returning data type. So it makes the code much easier to read and also to debug because a lot of times the errors are just simply because of the incompatibility of the type that we pass in into the function. And so it, it may cause a lot of problems. So type hinting is very useful to avoid this issue. Now, if the function does not return any value, then um, we will just simply return uh, none type. So this is just to print out something. And um, so for example, show hello, so it just um, doesn't do anything apart from printing out this string. Now, if you want to read more about type hinting, you can go into this uh, website and um, you can read about it. What are the types that are available and uh, how to define it within your function. Moving on to Visual Studio Code, which is really exciting because I know a lot of you are using it for various kinds of projects. Visual Studio Code is no doubt one of the best pieces of software Microsoft has created since Windows 95. Okay, to start off, my favorite way to open a project folder in Visual Studio Code is simply to drag this folder to the Visual Studio Code icon over here on the taskbar. And here is our project uh, folder. Now, a more nerdy way to do do this is to use the terminal for opening Visual Studio Code. It's also very simple. You can simply cd to this project folder and then you can do code and then dot. Oops, it doesn't work. Now in Windows, this will work immediately, but uh, on a MacBook like this, you first need to add the binary to your path. So let me quickly go back to the to Visual Studio Code. And if you go to Command Palette and type Show Command, yeah, now we can install Code Command in Path. So let's click on it. And so after doing this, I hope that we will now be able to, to use the Code Command within the terminal. Let's try it out. Yeah, 
now it works. So here again, we have this project folder open in Visual Studio Code. If you still get some error like this, I'll put it on my screen, then it's likely because Visual Studio Code is using Python 2, which is no longer supported in the recent Mac OS. So if you installed Python with Homebrew, you can just um, symbolic link um, Python to Python 3 with this command. I put it on my screen as well. And now after restarting the terminal, you should be able to use the code command uh, within your terminal. Okay, one of my favorite things in Visual Studio Code is code completion. It works much, much better than within JupyterLab or Jupyter Notebook. So for example, if I want to read this data set over here, um, pd.readcsv, right? And you can see that as we type, all the suggestions appear over here and we just need to um, move with the, with the keyboard in order to select what we want to use. Similarly, if you have long variable names, it's much faster and much less error prone to use the code completion instead of typing everything manually. Okay, talking about keyboard shortcuts, almost all the Jupyter Notebook shortcuts that we mentioned earlier in this video also work within VS Code as well. Although some extra shortcuts I think are pretty important to know in VS Code are, for example, Command Shift P, that is to open the command palette in Visual Studio Code. And here you can see all kinds of things that, um, that we can do. For example, if you want to create um, a new file within your project folder and you can choose, okay, text file, Python file or Jupyter Notebook. So there are a lot of things that you can do from the command palette. The other use for shortcut is Command W so that is to close the current um, current file and um, you can choose to save or not save. You can see all the keyboard shortcuts available in Visual Studio Code by clicking on the setting icon over here and go to keyboard shortcuts. So here you can see all the different keyboard shortcuts that are available and you can also edit them as well. You can remove it or change it to anything you like. Oh, and I forgot another thing that I usually do with the comment palette that is to search for a file. So here you can see that in my folder, there are a lot of files, right? And if your project folder is somewhat complicated and sometimes it may take a lot of time to search for the right file that you want to open, especially if you have photos and subfolders within your directory. My favorite way is just to go to the comment palette and delete this thing and then you can search for the notebook that you want to open. So it's very, very much faster than searching for the file in here. Another thing that I see a lot of people and colleagues and friends struggle when they first use Visual Studio Code is that they don't know how to run a Python script. So suppose that I have this debugging.py file over here and I want to run this file in the notebook style. Now, how do I do that? Um, you can do that by just um, select what you want to run and then shift enter. Then yeah, so you may have to install the IPython kernel. And here is the interactive window that you can use to um, basically test out your code and do all kinds of things that you usually do within a Jupyter Notebook. Now, if Shift Enter doesn't work for you and you might realize that you are deleting the code instead of running it, then you might need to change some global setting in Visual Studio Code. So you can go to setting. Um, you can also use command comma to open the settings here. And then you can search for send selection to interactive window. And here, if you are not having this one checked yet, then you should um, check this uh, this option. And after that, when you press Shift Enter, you will send the selected code from the Python file to the Jupyter interactive window. Now, a very cool trick, um, suppose that you don't want to have to select and run the code uh, like this, then you can also do something really, really cool. So let me just open this um, separate cells.py here. The trick is that within a Python script like this, you can also define the different code cells as well. You can kind of like separate the cells that you want to run. So the way to do this is to uh, do kind of like comment and the uh, double percent sign over here. And so from here to here, we um, are effectively turning this, um, this part of the code into a notebook cell 
we can run the cell and we can debug the cell and do all kinds of things with it. Or similarly, we can also just shift enter to run this, uh, this cell. So this is pretty crazy, right? I think it's pretty handy when you want to, to separate your, uh, your Python script into different so, and work with it just like you would do in a Jupyter notebook. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, debugging code in Visual Studio Code is very similar to how you would do in Jupyter Lab as we showed earlier. For example, you can set breakpoints by clicking on the on the left side of the code over here and then you can go to debug um, this debug icon and um, click on run and debug. And if you choose Python file, then we are now debugging this Python file. And here they are exactly the same options that you can use to control your debugging flow. So this is very, very similar. And here are the variables that are within um, your current environment. And so all the principles stay exactly the same. It just looks slightly different. Now, let me stop this thing. Moving on to the next tip. When you have a large script, it can be very hard to find things. And because I'm a very lazy person, I don't like having to scroll through um, different files and go through the code to find something manually. So I try to use the find and replace option as much as possible. So suppose that I want to find this uh, test function, I want to see where it is being used, um, then I can just double click or select this um, the name of this function and control F. And now we can see that we um, have all the tests um, highlighted in our script. And if I want to, for example, replace this function name with something else, I can also replace it uh, with something else and replace all over here. And better yet, you can also find and replace something in the whole project directory. So the way to do that is just to command shift F and here if we type test, then we will see all the places that we have the test variable. And similarly, you can also do replace over here, but be careful because sometimes you might be accidentally replacing something that is not relevant. All right, let's leave VS Code for a moment and talk about RStudio. Now, if you've worked with R before, you probably already know RStudio is an IDE for R. So just like PyCharm or JupyterLab, R for Python. Suppose that I have um, some functions over here, some code over here. The shortcut for running code is just to select what you want to, to run and control enter. And if you have only one line of code, then you don't need to select and you just press uh, control enter directly. And that would um, effectively run the current line or the current selection of the code. Another useful keyboard shortcut I use all the time is for bug commenting. So within RStudio, you can um, just select what you want to, um, to comment out and you can uh, do command shift C or control shift C if you're on Windows. And if we want to create a new script, then we can just do control shift N so that is N stands for new, I think. Um, and this would create a new R file for you. Okay, one trick that I wish I knew way sooner when I start with R and R Studio is that when you see a function um, and don't know where it is defined. So for example, if I have this script over here, this is run script and this script is using some functions from some other some other scripts. So for example, from the my function scripts over here, sometimes I want to see, I want to check how this function is defined. And previously I would have to find in different scripts and see where this function is defined. So it would take a lot of time, but a very, very easy way to do that is actually just to hit control or command um, and click on this, the name of this function. So click on the square here. And this would take you to the definition of this function. So this is much, much faster. The cool thing is that also if you want to go back to the previous script you were on, you can also click on this uh, go back button over here. So 
if I go back, then I'll go back to the run script. This is so, so, so much faster. And if you work on a very complex project with many different scripts and many different functions and a lot of things are going on, then it is very, very useful to do to use this. And in our studio, you can also find and replace uh, things easily with Control F um, if you want to find something within the current script or Control Shift F if you want to find within the whole uh, project directory. Okay, perhaps a less trivial tip that I have for you within R Studio is to create an R project. It's much better to create an R project when you have multiple files and multiple folders within your directory. I will show you why in a second. So if you go to um, file, you can create a new project over here and um, if you already have a current directory that you want to create projects for, you can also just click on existing directory. I will select my project, so productivity data science, and then I'll create project. Now, our files here are all relative to our current directory. So if we create a new script and we say source my functions, Dot R, we can see that um, yeah everything will be relative. If instead you don't create an R project, then you would ha probably have to set your working directory like this, and it's very very cumbersome, right? Um, suppose that I have something like users <laughs> to vu or something, and if I want to to share this script with someone else, then they would have to change this uh, directory to their own directory, and this is really really not not nice okay so as mentioned earlier debugging within our studio is also very very similar to what you would do in visual studio code or jupyter lab so suppose that i have my function over here if i do square hello like before so to debug this script first i will source this script and then i will set some breakpoints within this function or any other places in your code that you want to debug. And then we can just um, run this line and now we'll be directed into kind of like a browsing window. So in this in this debugging browsing window, we can do all kinds of things um, that we saw before. We can choose to do next, step in, step out, or continue. And here you can also browse different variables here. If we, um, for example, if we type X, then we'll see that, oh, text X is actually hello. This is also where you can see the all the values of the variables in your environment. If we do continue, yeah, this will return error already. Yeah, so that's how debugging within RStudio works. Moving on to the next tip, let's talk about packages. If you say pandas is the staple tool for data science in Python, then I'd say data.table is the essential package in R. So you can have a glimpse into data.table in this book. So I will put it in the description of the video. I love using data.table for data wrangling, data cleaning, and just uh, exploratory data analysis in general, because it has really concise syntax like this, and it is extremely fast. If you work with data sets with millions of records, then data table is the way to go. So here you can see a few examples of tabulating and aggregating data with data table. So here you can calculate the mean for a certain group of data points, or you can um, tabulate the data by a certain group. And all these operations are very, very fast. This is also a very typical syntax in uh, with data table that you most likely would have to be familiar with so I would recommend you to look into this if you're working with very large data sets in your project. And in R, there's also a few good libraries for data profiling. The one that I like the most is, what is it called again? Inspect DF. Um, so here it is. This is a library that allows you to do very quick checks on the data. If I just load these two libraries and I'll just um, use this um, this iris data set as an example. So this is how it looks like and um, I can show different things on this data set. So for example, if I want to show the data types of 
the columns in this data set, you can see that um, we have four numeric columns and we have one factor column. And if we want to look at the memory size of each different columns, you can see that all these columns are exactly of the same size and you can search for the correlation between all the different numeric columns in our data set. So this is a kind of like a correlation diagram or chart that shows okay for each pair of, um, of columns how much is the correlation that we Pearson's correlation there is and um, you can also inspect numeric columns by using inspect here, num here and this function allows us to get a glimpse of um, the distribution of the values in each different column. You can also use ggplot, for example, to create these graphs, but it's much faster this way, just to get the first glimpse of the data. You can take a look at the documentation over here to read more about this, uh, this library. And I'm sure there are a lot of other libraries as well, but this is the one that I know. Okay, I've sometimes got questions from some of you about how to run code in parallel in R especially if you have some relatively demanding calculation to do. R is generally quite fast because many R functions are vectorized and they are actually written in C, C++, and Fortran. These languages are faster than an interpreted language like Python or the R language itself. When we have a big for loop that takes a lot of time and we can't vectorize it, this is when we need to parallelize our code to be able to run it faster. If you're not sure what parallelization means, it means you distribute the computation to multiple cores of your CPU. The opposite of running in parallel is to run serially. For example, with a for loop, you just go step by step, do the calculation and move on to the next. And in this case, only one core is used to run the computation, which is apparently slower than running it in multiple cores. Just like you building a house with four people is faster than building a house all by yourself. Okay, in R, you can check how many cores that you have in your CPU. So if you run this detect core function, you can see that I have eight cores in my CPU. So that means that at maximum, I can use eight cores at the same time to run my code. So in order to run some code in parallel, it's actually um, quite simple. You can um, first just uh, define how many cores that you want to use. Usually we just use yeah one less core. So here I would use seven cores. And uh, in the do parallel package, we have a make cluster function that takes how many cores that you want to use and to prepare the clusters. I, I'm not sure how, yeah, what exactly is going on underneath, but the, the, the idea is that we would make the clusters and we would register these clusters into, yeah, to do parallel. So let me quickly run this. Okay, now we have the clusters ready. Now suppose that as an example, I have a function like this, that is to get prime numbers. So this function basically check all the primes that are smaller than a certain number. So for example, if I say get prime numbers of five, then we have all the prime numbers that are smaller than or equal to this number. So if this is 20, then this is all the primes that we have that, that are less than, less than or equal to 20. Now getting prime numbers is usually a very slow operation. So to check if a number is a prime is very time consuming, uh, especially yeah, the larger the number it is. And checking for primes is also one of the basics uh, for cryptography. Okay, now I'll test different methods to run something. So suppose that I have a sequence of numbers like this. So um, index is 10 to 10,000. So if we print it out, index is basically just all the numbers um, between 10 and 10,000. And for each of these numbers, I would get some results um, by passing this number to the get prime numbers function. So this would effectively give me a list of all the prime numbers that are smaller than or equal to each of these numbers in this index, uh, in index variable. Now, if we use for loop, a system time is system dot time is just the way we, just similar to time it uh, magic. It's just um, check how long a certain piece of code would work. So I put everything within this system dot time function over here, 
And if we run this, let's see how long it takes. I should have reduced this <laughs> to 1000 or so. You can see that it takes a lot of time. Okay, time elapsed is 25 seconds. Now, if we use lapply, lapply is kind of like a function family within R that sort of tries to mimic the for loops. So let's try it out. Yeah, you can see that the time elapsed is slightly, slightly uh, shorter, but it's actually not much um, better than just a regular for loop. Now, if we do do parallel, so within do parallel, there's this syntax that we need to get familiar with. So yeah, for each of these number here, we just do parallel like this. It's just a syntax that is available in do parallel. Now, you can see that the time is much, much shorter. So it's twice faster. So if you have to run some code that is very time consuming, you can then use the do parallel package to sort of um, try to speed up your code uh, by running your code in parallel. Okay, finally, we get to talk about Excel, the king of it all. I must admit that I'm really not an Excel guru. I actually try to avoid Excel as much as I can in my work, but I've done some Excel in some projects and the more I use it, the more I appreciate how powerful it is and how much it can do. So I'm gonna show you some of my favorite Excel tricks for data analysis that I've learned along the way. Okay, when you first see some data in Excel, so for example, this is the uh, data set that I have. It's usually useful to look at the status bar. So this is a status bar. And if you want to look at a specific column, you can just um, select this column and you can see all the descriptive statistics over here. You can also edit this status bar by right click on, the, on, on this area and then you can uh, select what you want to look at. So here I'm interested in the average. I'm not much interested in the numerical count and also not much about the sum. So uh, here you can kind of like select the metrics that you want to, to look at. Okay, moving on to the next tip. For quick data exploration in Excel, it's very handy um, to use the analyze data tool over here. If you go in the home tab, you go all the way to the right, you will see that there's a analyze data button over here. Let's click on it. Yeah, I should have select this whole data set and analyze data. So you can see some first um, pivot tables and pivot charts that uh, Excel has automatically generated for you based on the data that, um, that we selected. But we can also, um, for example, ask something about your data. So here they have some suggestions over here. Suppose that we want to search. Yeah, we're gonna check the percentage of total, the employment length, for, for each person home ownership. So here, then we can see, this is the chart that we have, and we can see uh, what is the employment length for each different groups of um, population in our data set. Um, if we go back, we can also search for something else, or I can ask questions, for example, what is the average loan amount for each different loan grade? average loan amount. So maybe it doesn't work so well with the, doesn't recognize this. So yeah, so here's much better. And now we can see this is a, the average loan amount for each different loan grade. So this is a very quick way to analyze your data instead of having to create um, your own pivot table. So you can also go for pivot table, existing worksheet, um, and then you can also create different things, uh, different charts and uh, different tables over here, uh, right? But yeah, usually this would take a little bit more time. Um, so person income, uh, loan intent. So I would prefer to use the analyze data tool over here. It works pretty well. Yeah, and if we want to insert um, the um, tables or charts from here, you can also just uh, click on insert pivot chart or insert pivot tables to get this uh, this chart out in your in your worksheet. Okay, another thing that I think every data analyst should know is Excel table. Let me show you what it does. So suppose that you have a table like this 
and you want to turn it into an Excel table, you just click on anywhere in your data range and then go to insert and table. And um, yeah, this is the range that we have. So we can check again and it is all good. And my table has headers, which is good. We can click on it. And now we have, um, this has been turned into a table. Now, a table is basically a way to tell Excel that the data in this range are all related and need to be treated as such. So notice that there's also a table a ribbon over here, a table tab over here. And here, this is a table name. So um, we can change this table name to credit risk table, click enter. And now we can just refer to, um, to this table. So for example, we calculate the average of credit risk and then select the column that we want to, to check here. So this is very similar to how <laughs> Python works, right? We can just really just select the columns that we want to uh, that we want to calculate on or we can do average income divided by average credit risk so we can also do something so for example average uh, i don't know just some random thing loan amount yeah and this is how you can very easily refer to a certain data field within a table. And this also makes it much easier to read as well. Um, I see a lot of people just use, for example, just calculate things and refer to it as just, yeah, just ABC, for example, person income here, which is also fine. But every time we will have to go back into this table and find out exactly what this column B actually stands for. So this is a very handy trick. Another thing that Excel table makes it very easy for us is when we want to create a new calculated column. For example, if I want to create a new column that is equal to this divided by two, then Excel table would automatically fill uh, down this, this value for you. So you don't have to actually go and uh, fill it down yourself. Okay. Another tip in Excel that I got to know is that um, you can build an interactive Excel report for your colleagues or your boss and let them filter the data very easily. To create slicers for our data range, we can simply click on anywhere in your data range and then go to insert and go to slicer. And then you can select different columns that you want to use. For example, I want to select um, the person home ownership. I want to select the loan intent and loan grade and then click OK. Then we're going to see that we have a few different filtering um, slicers over here. And now your colleagues or anyone who look at this data file, um, they can simply select different options that they want to filter on. So this is very, very handy. And yeah, if we have multiple slicers, we can filter on uh, multiple columns at the same time. And to clear the filter, we can just click on this clear filter button over here. When it comes to shortcuts in Excel, there are tons of shortcuts. I've seen some consultants or whoever who doesn't even need to use the mouse for doing stuff in Excel but I'm nowhere near that level. I just know a few useful shortcuts that I use all the time. So I'll show you uh, what they are. So for example, if you want to select a whole row, then you just uh, do control shift and right arrow to select this row and control shift down to select this whole data range. And if you want to select a whole column, then you just uh, control shift and down arrow. Or usually if you want to select a whole range, then we just um, do control A. And to move quickly between different worksheets. So for example, I have another sheet over here. Then to move to this next worksheet, you can just simply hold down the control key and then page up or page down. On MacBooks, um, you don't have the page up and page down button. Then you would just uh, hold down also the function key. So um, if I do this, yeah, this would basically, yeah, if you do key up or key down, then you would effectively move between these um, different worksheets. Okay, another tip that I think is quite fun is that when you want to type the header for your data, so for example, I have some data over here, um, A, B, B, C, C. 
Okay, this is column one and I want to also type column two over here, but the cursor, you notice that it will always jump down to the next, um, to, the, to the cell below when you hit enter. And uh, when you type headers, you don't want that. So in order to make your cursor run sideways, you can uh, simply select this whole range and then start typing. So column one, column two, column three. And so you notice that when I hit enter, the cursor would um, just jump sideways like this. So if you have multiple columns, you can also do exactly the same. So it's much faster than moving your cursor with your mouse. Okay, if in your job you're using a lot of statistical analysis in Excel, a nice feature in Excel is the data analysis feature. So if you go under the data uh, tab, you can see that there is an analysis tools. If we click on it and we check the analysis tool pack and click on OK, then we will have this data analysis button over here. If we click on it, we can see that we have a whole bunch of different uh, statistical analysis that are available within Excel. For example, if you want to um, calculate the correlation between some numeric variables, I'll just select um, this range and um, yeah, labels is in the first row and then click on OK. Then we have uh, kind of like a table, <laughs> like a correlation matrix in Python that you can that you can create easily. There's also a bunch of other things that you can do with it. For example, to create histogram, moving average, or to conduct t-test, for example, or regression analysis. So it's all very, very easy with this tool. Okay, when you see that you have some blank values in some of your columns, so for example, I just delete some of these here. Yeah, in Python or R, it's very easy to detect the, um, the missing values, but in Excel, it's a little bit more tricky. A trick to identify all the blank values is to highlight your range, and then under the Home tab, you can go to Find and Replace over here, and go to Special and then we can select blanks over here and click on OK. And here we go, we have all the blank cells being highlighted. Now we can either mark these cells um, with color or we can also simply fill it in with, with some value. For example, now I fill it in with zero for the first cell and then um, control enter to fill in all the cells. Okay, the next tip is when you want to draw people's attention to some values like min or max or some certain criteria that you define, then you can just apply some conditional formatting to your data. And uh, I find it very useful. For example, if um, you have a data range like this, and you want to highlight some mean or max or whatever um, value, then we can go into the conditional formatting button over here. And for example, you can add the data bars. So for example, just choose something, gradient fill, then this would create some, some kind of like bar charts for your data. Yeah, it really depends on what you want to do. You can also highlight, for example, the, the top percent with red, so you can see that we have these large, largest values over here. And if you want to create a custom rule to highlight your data, you can also go to highlight cell rules and uh, click on more rules. Here there are already a couple of uh, different options, for example, greater than, less than, or between some certain values or equal to something, then in more rules, you can also define even more complicated uh, condition. And here you can type your, your formula here. Okay, in Excel, if you are doing some uh, repetitive tasks, like doing some data formatting and transformation, like we did before, over and over again for multiple worksheets and also multiple data files, then it's time to automate it. And VBA is a very useful tool to automate these kind of tasks. In Excel, even if you don't know how to code in VBA, you can also just record a custom macros. And the way we do that is just to um, go to the developer tab and here we can see that we have a bunch of different things that we can do with VBA. If you don't have this developer tab, you can enable it in the settings somewhere in Excel and you can easily Google to find out how you can enable the developer tab. Now I'm gonna click on the record macro button over here and just um, the macro name is for example, test. 
and click on OK. Now I'll go ahead and do some formatting. For example, to make this um, table header bold, I would also probably do some conditional formatting here. And once I'm done, I can stop recording. Now, if you go to the macros button over here, you can see that we have a test macro here that is already created. And note that this test macro we created is also available to other workbooks as well. Now, I also usually like to create a button for my macro. So next time if I want to use it, I can just simply click on that button. So um, if we click on the button option, over here and clicking on on anywhere in our notebook then uh, we will be able to assign the macro to the macro test to this button so if we click on ok then we have the button 5 over here and we can edit this button as test button now suppose that in another worksheet we have some data that we want to to apply the same format, we can simply go to the macros and select this test macro and run. So here we are, we have the same transformation that we did for the other, um, for the other sheet. Or we can also create a button uh, for, that, um, for that macro like that. And so if we click on this button, we will just basically do exactly the same thing. And to actually see the VBA code that we just created uh, by doing all these transformations that we did before on our on our data range, we can go to Visual Basics button over here. And uh, here are all the steps that we that we did. So you know, just to select and make it the font bold, and then we would uh, do some conditional formatting here. And this is what the test uh, macro looks like under the hood. And if you know how to code in VBA, you can also do all kinds of stuff. And so the rule of thumb is if you find yourself doing the same process twice or more, then you should consider making a macro for it. Just like you should consider creating a function to reuse it next time uh, in R or Python. Congratulations on finishing this bootcamp. I hope you have learned something useful. I didn't learn all these tips and tricks overnight, but rather over years of tinkering and discovering new things every day with these tools. And the key here is to not to feel overwhelmed and instead focus on one or two tips at a time and slowly incorporate them into your workflow. Stay curious, keep practicing, and you'll become a pro in no time. I'm also working on creating two courses at the moment. The first one is advanced data visualization and storytelling, and the other one is how to use AI tools for data science. If you're interested in hearing more and get notified when those courses are available, you can use the link below to fill in your email. And again, if you like the video, don't forget to smash the like button, and I love you all. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.